So I already did a review and a top 10 moments video for Aftermath Life Debt, but there were so many connections and little details revealed about the Star Wars universe, I thought it would be cool to do a video that covers all of them. So these are 50 new connections and fun facts from Aftermath Life Debt. Keep in mind that this video is full of spoilers. That said, let's get started. Number one. Emperor Palpatine was exploring the origin of the dark side before even the Clone Wars began. He did so by placing beacons and sensors in the Outer Rim on worlds like Jakku. Number two. There was a bar on the Death Star. Not an overly important fact at all, but it's fun to think about. What other amenities did it have? A laundromat? A spa? Number three. Luke's relationship to Darth Vader was not common knowledge. We know from Bloodline that nobody knew about Leia and Vader for a very long time, but for some reason, I figured everyone just knew about Luke. Number four. Rey Sloan makes yet another canon appearance. This is her third book, and she's also appeared in the comics and multiple short stories. She's a fantastic character, and I hope John Jackson Miller is thrilled to see her pop up again and again. Number five. The mysterious admiral from the first aftermath is Gallius Rax. Some people are already theorizing that he's Snoke. I don't agree with that, but he is a very manipulative and intimidating antagonist for the Aftermath trilogy. Number six. Coruscant was largely abandoned by the Empire and fell into civil war. The Imperial Security Bureau is pretty much the only holdout left. Number seven. Mass Amida remained on Coruscant and had little real power in the Imperial Remnant. The New Republic wouldn't even accept him as a prisoner. Number 8. General Hux's first name is Armitage. Number 9. General Hux was also a bastard. I don't just mean he's a jerk, I mean he was Brindle Hux's illegitimate son. Brindle doesn't think very highly of his son, calling him weak and skinny, but does have hopes for greatness in his future. Number 10. There are multiple references to the Empire needing children to survive, foreshadowing the philosophy of the First Order. This connects back to the Servants of the Empire series, and also the Force Awakens and Finn's story of being taken from parents he never knew. Number 11. The Empire formed a Shadow Council to run everything behind the scenes. It was led by Gallius Rax. Ray Sloan, Brindle Hux, and other Imperial military minds were members. Number 12. There are vague rumors surrounding Palpatine's death, claiming that he lived many lives. This could be a cheeky nod to his clones in Legends. To be clear, his clones are not canon, thank the Force. I just think Windig snuck a little Easter egg in. Number 13. Snap got his nickname from Wedge Antilles himself because of his nervous habit of snapping his fingers. The Visual Dictionary claims he got the nickname because of his temper, which is also present in the book. Maybe Wedge was just being nice when asked why he gave him the nickname. Number 14. Han and Leia got married on Endor right after the battle. They wasted no time, unlike Legends, where they took years to get married. Number 15. There are hints that Gallius Rax has been pulling strings for a very long time, possibly manipulating or at least influencing Count Vidian from the book A New Dawn. Rax has certainly been around long enough, and connecting him back to previous villains is a good way to make him more imposing. Number 16. The Empire had 13 Super Star Destroyers at the time of the Battle of Endor. By the time of Life Debt, most of them were destroyed or commandeered by the New Republic. Number 17. The Emperor had a personal Super Star Destroyer named the Eclipse, which may or may not have been destroyed. This is at least a partial recanonization from Legends. We have yet to actually see the ship, but I think it's likely they only share a name as another nod back to Legends and specifically Dark Empire. Number 18. The Annihilator, General Tag's Super Star Destroyer from the Darth Vader comic, was overtaken by pirates. Number 19. The Acolytes of the Beyond stole a possibly ancient red lightsaber from a museum during a riot they started. They were nonviolent in the first book, but they've clearly changed their minds. I'm still not sure what they're up to. Number 20. Ray Sloan hunts for clues about Gallius Rax in the wreckage of the Imperialis, the same ship we see destroyed in the Lando comic. That ship was Palpatine's personal yacht, and it was filled with Sith artifacts until Lando blew it up. Number 21. 
the surviving Alderanians received scrap from the original Death Star to construct a space station as their new home. They seem to be pleased with that, but I think it's kind of strange to live in the remains of the weapon that blew up your planet. Number 22. The Black Sun is still operating and set up a base on Nar Shadda. That means they now have bases on at least three planets, which also include Mustafar and Ord Mantell. Number 23. Wedge has a limp and other injuries he received in the first aftermath. He was captured by the Empire, beaten, and tortured. These injuries could explain why we don't see him in The Force Awakens. Maybe he's retired or incapable of flying in his older age. Number 24. The New Republic developed new capital ships by dismantling Imperial ships and creating the Nadiri Mark I Starhawk, which might be the same ships we see in The Force Awakens. Number 25. The Jedi that survived Order 66 made a last stand on a planet called Maedar or Morad. Sloane couldn't remember the name, but a last stand did happen. I wish Sloane were a better history student, and I also hope that we get to hear more about this later. Number 26. Sloane grew up on a lawless planet called Ganthel. The Empire's ability to bring structure to her homeworld was what drove her to join it. Number 27. The Empire has a hidden secret fleet to use against the New Republic. I believe the Eclipse is in that fleet. Number 28. ME8D9 has been at Maz's castle for longer than Maz has. She is somewhat of a security droid that helps enforce the main rule at the castle, which is no fighting. Number 29. An underground Coruscant prison named Lehmanskate is mentioned, and could be a reference to the Lusankia prison from Legends. The Lehman Skate isn't a Star Destroyer, and I may be grasping at straws on this one. It's kind of a reach. Number 30. Wicket gave Leia the seed of a sanctuary tree, and she planted it. I love that she and Wicket had a special connection. Number 31. Luke taught Leia some Force techniques, which she practices. Thanks to Bloodline and The Force Awakens, we know her training doesn't really go anywhere, but it's cool seeing her at least take some interest. Number 32. Leia first learns that her child is a boy through the Force. She sees that he will be smart and strong, and tells Han that he will be an angel. Is that irony, or is it foreshadowing for future films? Number 33. The Rancor had a name, and it was Patissa. One of the interludes is about Malakili and how he's basically suicidal after its death. That is, until he finds a new purpose. Number 34. Imperial alien hatred has been strongly hinted at in the new canon, but it's outright confirmed here. Sinjir talks about how the Empire is made up of almost entirely humans because the Emperor considered aliens to be inferior. We also see a Grand Moff hunt aliens and talk about enjoying the meat of other sentient creatures. Number 35. Han confirms saving Chewie from slavery was the catalyst for the life debt, but also claims that Chewie saved him from traveling down a dark path. I expect we'll learn more about this in the Han Solo movie, and I'm glad that it's something that they retained from Legends. Number 36. Kashyyyk was a worldwide prison labor camp during the Galactic Civil War, where Wookiees were tortured, forced to breed, and used to build some of the Empire's more heavy-duty weaponry. Number 37. The reporter Tracine Kane and her Trandoshan cameraman Lug, both introduced in Aftermath, reappear here. In fact, many small characters from the first Aftermath show up again. These interludes look like we can piece them together to form individual short stories. Number 38. There is an area on Kashyyyk called the Black Forest, which has been dead for thousands of years, poisoned by some as-of-yet-unknown event that left its mark. I really hope we learn more about that somewhere down the line, and we really need to get some Old Republic stories. Number 39. Wookiee slaves had inhibitor chips similar to the ones explained by Anakin in The Phantom Menace. They could be used to cause pain or death in rebelling Wookiees. Number 40. Roshur trees, if that's how you pronounce that, on Kashyyyk, can grow so large that they can take half a day to walk around. I always knew they were huge, but I think this is the best description I've come across that helped me understand exactly how massive they really are. Number 41. The New Republic offers therapy droids that are very similar to BB-8 to injured veterans. 
Ewoks have also offered themselves as therapy Ewoks. This is terribly silly, but could explain how Ewoks began to spread throughout the galaxy as shown in Perfect Weapon. Number 42. Leia dreams of Padme's death, Han dead in the snow, Chewie in a cage, and Luke lost in the galaxy. Padme's death has already happened, and Han dead in the snow could foreshadow his death on Starkiller Base. Chewie in a cage could represent his being in a prison for most of the book. But Luke lost? I wonder when we'll see that, or if we ever will. Number 43. Yvonne from the Princess Leia comic reappears. Chuck Wendig did a really great job of incorporating canon elements from lots of different sources, and I was glad to see Yvonne still having a close relationship with Leia. Number 44. Yindor from Lost Stars and Bloodline is present for the Empire's retreat from Ryloth, and is immediately nominated as the Twi'lek representative to the New Republic, the same position he holds in Bloodline. Number 45. Cham Syndulla is mentioned, but it is unclear if he is still alive. He's been fairly prominent in the new canon, so I expect we'll find out more about him soon. If he's dead, I feel like we as an audience deserve to see that story on screen or on page. Number 46. Han and his team steal a Star Destroyer, which is something he claims to have done before. Maybe that's something else we'll see in the Han Solo movie. Number 47. Wedge forms Phantom Squadron from a group of washouts and weirdos. This is basically Wraith Squadron from Legends. Even the names are similar. Phantoms and Wraiths are the same thing. I would be surprised if this wasn't a straight-up reference, but why not just call it Wraith Squadron again? Maybe the story group has plans for the Wraiths in the future. Number 48. Crix Medine is likely killed in a mass assassination attempt on Chandrilla, although his death isn't 100% confirmed. While he's never been hugely important, I'll be a little bummed if he's dead. In Legends, he was also killed in kind of a lackluster way in the novel Darksaber. Number 49. Mon Mothma is shot during the same event, and this could lead to her health issues that cause her to step down as Chancellor. We learn about those health issues in Bloodline. And number 50. At the end of the book, Han and Chewie part ways to be with their respective families, although we know they eventually reunite. I wonder if we're ever going to see Chewie's family. If we do, I hope it's handled better than it was in the holiday special. We do know from the book Weapon of a Jedi that Chewie's wife's name is still Mala, same as it was in the special. And there you have it. 50 Facts and Connections from Aftermath Life Debt. Hopefully that helps you get a better idea of the state of the galaxy and our main characters, along with some new trivia to impress your friends with, if your friends are nerds like me. I've never done a list of facts video like this, so if you liked it or you didn't like it, either way, let me know in the comments. Until next time, thanks for watching, and may the Force be with you.